Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Hey, Maude, we, you're back online. Uh, we've lost yeah. you on the Skype. I'm, but I'm sorry. Uh, I'm using the iPad now. It seems to work. <laughs> so we'll try. <laughs> Is this um, is this the new one or the mini or is this the original? That's the question. No, no. I'm, I'm still in the uh, early second one. You and, you and me yeah. both. You and me both. You've been listening to some of this. Talk to yeah. us about your unique context uh, within uh, Amman, within Jordan, within the Middle East. Uh, you at the school have taken a pretty strong stand in not wanting to back off of the translation "Son of God." Uh, talk yes. to us about why, and talk to us about the response to that. Of course, I agree with some of the last things I heard. Uh, it's it's great. Uh, it, the, when we say "Son of God," uh, they hear that we're talking about a, a relationship beyond creation. That's what they hear. That there's a relationship within God, uh, i.e., Trinity, eventually. So they hear that there's a relationship between a father and a son. Um, that we're talking about really um, that uh, strikes at the heart of the problem because uh, what happens is in, in a theological struggle, in their history of struggle between different factions was a major theological um, conflict on this issue of relationship within God as it relates to the attributes of God because an attribute necessarily demands a relationship. So, uh, so if you have love, for example, you must have the lover and the one loved. And if the attribute is eternal, so is a relationship. That's just a simple thing. So, but if you deny a relationship to begin with, it's that if that's the mindset, so uh, then then you're forced into finding a way to explain how can a relationship, how can an attribute in God exists uh, exists without a relationship. That's a, that's a very, uh, that the bottom line struggle that what we may call the monadic monotheism would, would have. And so um, it, eventually what you end up having is really an inability to, to really define the attributes of God in a way that would appeal to man in a positive way. And actually the, the, the um, proposed solution ends up being that the attributes of God, um, such as love or compassion or holiness or, uh, or really mainly the relational attributes, if we may call it that, really stem, stem from, his, from his will. It's something he chooses to do if he so wills to do. So what you end up having is that the, that the dominant attribute is really that of a powerful will uh, if, if, we're, uh, if we're to talk into uh, normal language, um, a, a person of that persuasion would say, if God were to love me, it's because he chose to love at some point, but he may choose not to, and I really do not know. Whereas in the in a, uh, biblical concept of the triune God, where you have an eternal relationship, uh, a Christian would say, God loves me because he is love. He was always in a relationship of love, and that relationship is eternally defined as a father-son relationship, which is analog, which is analogical. It's like a father-son, human father to a human son, only it's infinitely more. It's way beyond us. It's so supreme, but it's like us. In other words, I can relate to it. And, and because there is that love relationship, there's that love attribute, in a relationship that that fixes that fixes the attribute of love and so he loves me because he is love he cannot but love uh, so that be, that's the beginning uh, road of a of a divergence in the in the understanding of of god uh, and so i don't want to uh, t- take take more time i've already spoken too much but that's that that becomes the heart of the issue be, be, the issue becomes really the attributes of god and how we define um, essentially, the uh, relational attributes would it, of would, God. In the Ahmad, would it be fair to say that in Islam, the the hub ar- around the character of God that we think of when we think of God is is primarily in the category of power and authority, 
Whereas yes. in Christianity, the hub that we're dealing with, it doesn't. It isn't that there isn't a power and authority, but there's a relational dimension that's in it that's not in uh, the the emphases that you see in Islam. Would that be the fundamental difference in terms of the conception of God that we're dealing with? Yeah. Yes, I think I think so. And be, because we have a relationship in the Christian biblical understanding, that means that God is self-sufficient. He, there's a, a love. A joy that is shared between the persons in in the one God, um, apart from creation. Whereas in a monadic monotheism, you have a, a relationship only starts in creation. So so creation becomes um, a need that God has in order to have a relationship. So uh, so power becomes before love in a monadic monotheistic understanding, whereas it's the opposite in the Christian understanding. Hmm. May I come in here a little bit, Ahmad, as well? I think you and I both agree that's why protection of the divine familial language is so important. Because mm-hmm. the other terms we have for God, like logos, or God is our fortress, God is our shepherd, these are ad extra. These are God relating to us. Yes. But when we speak of father and son, and, and Jesus, what, the term son is used of Jesus 40 times in, in John's Gospel alone, father becomes the dominant word for God. It replaces theos, essentially, in, in not entirely so, but about 50% more times used in John than even theos. Suddenly, it is God himself revealing this, these, not just descriptions, but now divine names. They're not titles like Christ. They are names of God, analogical names, because they're not identical to how we understand Father and Son, yet it's God giving us the language about himself that takes us into the Trinity ad intra. Now we see an eternal relationality between Father and Son, such that by the time we get to John of Damascus and others in the 8th century, they're saying anyone who says that the Father has not always been the Father, and that implies, or that ins- that, that not just implies it, that, that proves that he has always then had a son, that anyone who says that is heretical. So father-son language is the bridge into a full interrelational trinity that, that is the hallmark, is the, is the cornerstone of yes. Christian faith. And, and that's exactly the danger of uh, eliminating the familial language from the, from the Bible and, and translating the Bible. These, these words, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are untouchables. These are, they're, they're defining ontology, eternal. Uh, one, one way to, to talk, to, um, to communicate is to, uh, we know that in Islam, um, the life of Christ, he had a, he had a, a, a mysterious beginning a, 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 a miraculous beginning. He had a mirac- they, they say that he was born of a virgin. He had a miraculous life. They agree that he was sinless. And he, has a, he had a miraculous ending, too. Of course, they have a different way of looking at it. But, but at least it, it says that the description of the life of, of Christ on earth really begins outside earth, outside time and space. So we only, uh, and that's what the, we, that's what we tell them. We tell them that it, you know when we talk about Christ, you're only talking about a small part of a bigger life, uh, that is the life of God it's, uh, itself, and and uh, that that's a, a good way to be to begin talking about that the the story of Jesus is talking about this, the the person of God outside of us, out, the God without us. That is. Uh, so that you're gradually uh, saying that the relationship of the one true God with us really stems from a relationship within God without us, outside of us. And the idea and, the Son is uncreated, that, that He's eternal, that, yes. that, that He's not a part of the creation, but in fact sits over the creation is a very, very important part mm-hmm. of this overall conception uh, that, that, that has to be broken through. That's where the bridge has to take you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then, uh, this, then, then that takes us to the, the uniqueness of why Father, Son. And, and if we challenge the other side to say, well, can you think of a more beautiful relationship? What, what other concept can you find uh, that would take you there? What other uh, relationship can you uh, define or come up with uh, to, um, to, have, um, uh, to have an understanding of God that is uh, 
what the New Testament is talking about. If you want to eliminate that as father, son, what else, what, what replacement can you have to, to have the same kind of relationship? And there's no answer to this. Um, this is a revelation that is, has no replacement. Um, and, and there's so much beauty in that father-son relationship in, in 114 of John. It's a glory of the only, the monogamous, the only one of, uh, who is fa father and son. There's a glory of, in that relationship. And then defines it in 118 of John as this, this son who is monogamous theos, who is the son God, who is in the bosom. There's this, this intimate relationship between father and son. And that's the very um, source of the attributes of God. But that's that's who he is in eternity before there ever was a world. You know, there's an irony, uh, Ahmad, in your citing John 1, 14, as you've done, because when you use the phrase only begotten, even in English, English hearers wrestle with what is that what does that mean? What are we actually saying? Because the connotation that it has with a lot – when you hear the word begotten, you're in a category that normally speaking you're saying isn't applied to the Son. And so you're left with the situation of having to explain what it means. So you get translations like unique Son of God or uh, uncreated Son of God to get at what only begotten means. So we've got the same problem in English, uh, uh, and, and, and we have to wrestle with – other expressions to help us get at what the terminology is, which initially, when you hear it, might take you in a direction that isn't the direction you're trying to go with the terminology. But backing up just a little bit, one thing that I marvel at is what language in the world at uh, what language in the world is there that doesn't have a word for daddy or father and son? Every two-year-old knows that that he or she is a son or a daughter of a Daddy. So the Lord chose this extremely simple language on the one Absolutely. hand to reveal the deepest reality of who He is. It takes us beyond what we can quite fathom at the same time. That raises one more question. Uh, I mean, another illustration is we are said to be begotten of God. You know, everyone who has been born of God. I don't think we would want to toss out that terminology because that sounds physical. And it sounds procreational. Uh, and so all, like you said, in, in English, we have the same kinds of words that by themselves, in isolation, could lead people to wrong conclusions. But it's the explanation, and if I can say it, the, the whole challenge of exposition mm -hmm. of Scripture uh, in preaching the Word and exp expositing the Word is taking the Word, translating the Word, and our commitment to the biblical languages here at Dallas is to how should it be translated, how should it be preached, how should it be applied. Uh, those are the constant challenges of, of handling mm -hmm. the inerrant word. Ahmad, one more question as we uh, close out this segment. Uh, from an Arab context, give us one, two, or three suggestions that would help people who are hearing this podcast know some steps that they can take in as they share their faith with a uh, person of Arabic uh, uh, language, of Muslim persuasion, uh, to get to s the core of the message and not get uh, sidetracked on some of the translation, you know, uh, nuances. Okay. Um, I'll try. Um, um, <clears throat> One thing um, in communicating uh, with our friends is uh, is to communicate. One is the assur assurance in our relationship with God. There's a sense of, I know Him. I know what He is like. Uh, he, when He told me He loved me, I, I can understand what that attribute of love is, and uh, because I experienced it, only His love is infinite and great, and I can I can be assured of His love. Uh, the, the concept of assurance. Uh, in the in their perspective, it's, it's it's limiting God to be sure of something, to be sure that He's going to act in in a certain way is limiting Him. He is so powerful that He's not bound to a promise or law. So what, by communicating to our friends that that's in their understanding, uh, He's not bound to a promise or law. But in in our understanding as Christians, God, uh, you know, God is um, he, surely He's powerful but not at the expense of his love or his holiness. All his attributes work together. Another way to communicate uh, 
with our friends is to communicate the concept of grace um, and, and that you know God acts in spite of our sins in other words we're not uh, talking to them that we are higher than them as if we are better than them we are just fellow sinners <laughs> saved by his grace we're not we don't un, we're not better people than they are we are just telling them what we have found what God has has done to us so that we it's very important to communicate this uh, so that they do not are, they're not offended to think that we know better than than they um, and then certainly uh, that when we communicate anything about the Christian faith there's nothing political intended here we are very sorry about the Crusades in the 11th 12th centuries we're very sorry but that's not what Christ would have commanded. Uh, so when we communicate the gospel, we're not trying to make a political invasion here at all. We're, we're loving people. It's a, it's a, a human being talking to another a human being. And in doing so, we're, we're, um, when we're asking for a response, we are giving really uh, to that person the sense of honor. In other words, uh, you know, in so many countries, there's lack of freedom. Uh, and, and to them, you know, uh, somebody changing from one persuasion to another is a no-no. It's it's very bad and, and uh, it's not accepted. But we, but rather than communicate freedom to them, we communicate the concept of honor. In other words, uh, my friend, I'm I'm telling you these things because I honor you because I'm giving you the if, the the honor of choosing, the honor of responding to this. Uh, God, what God is trying to tell you about Himself. So uh, God is honoring you by by asking you to choose. So choosing is a giving you honor, and the language of honor really communicates. Mm. So the language of assurance, the language of grace, the language of honor, and make, to make sure that we're there's nothing p political about Christians sharing their faith with other people. That's very helpful. We have uh, addressed the topic of translation and terminology. Uh, we will have other podcasts in which we will address the issues of being, being a Christian in a different culture, and especially cultures that uh, are dominated by a particular religion that would be uh, different than and even at times hostile to Christianity. But we've uh, sort of addressed this uh, using the illustration. We've used the wheel and the spokes. Uh, we've not gone around that wheel one, two, three, four. We've come at it from all different angles, and hopefully the conversation uh, has been helpful. Uh, Maud, we will uh, connect with you again to uh, bring you into uh, these kinds of conversations. We so appreciate your leadership there. We appreciate your expertise, but we especially appreciate your heart uh, for the Arab peoples. And uh, Daryl and Scott, thank you as well for your time today. We deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.